So Tony, with these interviews that I've done, I've found that people either remember their first music lesson with great fondness, or the absolute opposite. Do you remember your first music lesson? I, I do actually, because I we had a piano at home. Many houses, of course, in those days did have a piano. Um, and I know people, as you know, the years went on, who sold them for TVs so they could buy a TV. Um, but although it was clear that I was fascinated by playing the piano and I played by ear, which was probably good for me, although teachers later told me it wasn't good for me, but I think it was good for me. Do you know why me. they say that? It's because they can't do it. That's my theory. <laughs> <laughs> so I used to hear all these things on the radio and I used to try and play them on the piano and... I'm surprised that my parents never did anything about deciding to follow that up and give me a teacher, get me a teacher. And one day when I was nine years old, a teacher, when I was in what was then called Standard 3, said, I, you know, I'm happy to teach anybody piano if, if they're interested. So um, whereas about four boys in the school, it was an intermediate boys school in Timaru, uh, signed up, uh, or got their parents to sign them up for lessons, I signed myself up. <laughs> and then went home and told my parents that I'd signed myself. They didn't object, which was good. So from Mr Roper, who was just my school teacher, um, I had a lesson after school once a week for the rest of that year. And then I went to the nuns in Timaru. I was a year older than Michael Houston and um, the nuns and often came across him when he was going to lessons and that sort of thing but we all knew that when we entered competitions in Timaru the, the, the outcome was always a foregone conclusion <laughs> <laughs> but I did enjoy my lessons with Mr Roper um, as you can see I can still remember his name um, I didn't really enjoy my lessons um, with the nuns after that uh, and I gave up but when I was in sixth form what's now known as year 12 I decided I really had to you know go get back to proper lessons and I went back to the same teacher um, and things went a lot better um, by then I was playing uh, things like Liszt Hungarian Rhapsody and all sorts of things and she just let me do whatever I wanted but then I went to another teacher um, when, I, when uh, I went into year 13, into the seventh form, and uh, started going, you know, entering exams and that sort of thing. But passing grade exams was not something that really suited me. I wasn't interested, I've never been interested in qualifications and that sort of thing, except where I had to have them, as I, you know, did to become a teacher and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, and, and that went well. But when I went to university, that's when I stopped actually having piano lessons. And by then, I had, you know, fiddled around writing a lot of music um, in my teenage years. And so my focus at university was the academic and the, the his historical and the composition side. So I, maj I majored in composition as... The years went as the years went by and did an honours degree in composition with David Sell. Right. And your memories of uh, university moving up to the big smoke from Timaru up to Christ at Canterbury University? <laughs> it was good for me. I was a relatively quiet teenager. Um, and Christchurch is very different from Timaru. Timaru, you know, we when we lived there, we thought it was a big town, but it's a small town. <laughs> and coming to Christchurch was... And I, and I quickly made... Uh, two or three friends in the um, music area and eventually ended up, you know, flatting with them and that sort of thing. So um, uh, it was, I never found it an uncomfortable change, but it was certainly very different from what I was used to. And I did enjoy my university time. I met my wife there in my second year at university. And uh, we were married before I finished university, <laughs> at the age of 21. <laughs> so at the age of 21, you, you were married, and, and what did you think you were going to do next? Well, I, when I went to university and told my parents that I was going to study music, uh, 
I don't know, my parents were not the sort of people that decided that wasn't going to work. And I've, I've dealt with a lot of my own students since, and their parents are trying to steer them in certain directions, sometimes against their, their clear passions, which I think is some, disappointing. But all my father said was, well, I hope it's going to end in a job. And for my first couple of years, it possibly wasn't going to end in a job until my wife took charge and said, you know, why don't you uh, follow the teaching line? And that meant getting a... Um, a teacher's... Uh, yeah, yeah, because in those days, university cost us nothing except expenses. Um, and we were actually paid to go to the teacher's college. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can see where your wife was coming from. Yeah, <laughs> and we were paid an allowance if we planned to go to Teachers College at the university. So that's what I did, and it was actually a good decision because I look back on my long teaching career with great pleasure and fondness, and um, it was a great life. And I taught for over 30 years. Um, I, did, I started in, in Wellington. We went to Wellington to start with, but I then taught for 33 years at Linwood High School, which then became Linwood College in 2000. And it was what was known a couple of years ago as a low decile school. It was a decile too. But it was a school that suited me down to the ground. And um, I had a wonderful team of music and drama teachers around me. Although they changed, we seemed to have a good team as, the, as time went on, and um, we became known for the performing arts. That's a great achievement from that part of town, which of course is where I grew up as well. Yeah, well that's right, yeah. yeah. But I went to, the, 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 f- the first contact I had with Linwood College was going there on, sec- on what we called section on teacher training for six weeks because uh, my wife had gone to that school um, she lived in the area, well, not quite in the area, but it was the nearest school. And she, she talked about the performing arts there. There were people like John Kim, um, who was actually the founder of what is now Court Theatre. And he did a lot of um, drama productions for professional theatre early on, then repertory theatre, and he was the drama teacher there. Um, Don Makara was an art teacher also heavily involved in the drama side of things. Peter Lee Jeffries, who was an internet who was a nationally known um, costume designer for New Zealand Ballet, for the Court Theatre, all sorts of other things, eventually even Canterbury Opera and, uh, and other organizations. He was head of English there and of course did all the costume designs for productions. And Kit Powell, who is a New Zealand composer, was up a, just before I went there, had been a music, a math teacher for a long time, but also taught senior students music, and he wrote original productions. And it was this original, original drama, music drama aspect that thought made my wife think that it would interest me. And I went there, and we had a ball. And Kit Powell used to say to me things like, "There's one thing that's always stayed with me." He said, "You know." Working with stu- working with kids is better than working with adults because kids will do anything. Kids can do anything. And he talked about what he would sometimes ask kids to do. And he would talk about what he sometimes would ask adults to do. For example, he told me once that he'd written this piece for the Royal Christchurch Musical Society. Or well, one or the other. It might have been the Harmonic Choir. There were two big choirs in Christchurch at that time. And he used um, a Maori text for part of the composition and he wanted them to do um, some movement with it and he said getting um, getting middle class white people to do Maori movements was next to impossible and he did not manage to achieve what he wanted to achieve but with the kids he could and I've never forgotten that and he's right Uh, and I've always worked enjoyed working with young people the problem is that they trust you. <laughs> they they say they always think if he's asking me to do that, it must be possible. 
And of course, as adults, we don't let people inspire us that way. We resist. And I find working with adults um, that there is a willingness, but that blind trust is not there. That's <laughs> so, so interesting. So you were at Linwood College for such a long time. Did you inherited, I guess, this this uh, great um, spirit of creativity? But as the sort of decades passed, did you find that the things changed as with the, with the students and society and, and so on, or did, was it just the same throughout your um, tenure there? No, it was. It changed because more than anything because of the increasing multi multicultural nature of the school and the and the area, the geographical area of Christchurch that it was in. But even more because of the different drama teachers that came through, um, and you know, it was only I'd only been there for four or five, four uh, just a little over four years when uh, John Kim died, and um, Paul Bushnell, who is now with Radio New Zealand, took over from him. Um, but then, as time went on, there were towards the end of my time at Linwood, two or three young much younger <laughs> than me, uh, drama teachers with different strengths and different passions. And that was inspiring because my, my view was always feed their passion, feed what they want to do, let them do what they want to do, and that will mean that they will do their best. Yes. Um, and that worked. And with those later ones I mean I haven't been there now for um, I haven't been you know it's 10 years since I was at Linwood um, College um, but I'm still in touch with some of them um, and I like to see what they're doing and and um, they're doing great work um, sometimes at school sometimes beyond school but um, those sorts of things kept things fresh yes <laughs> they evolved yeah. And one thing which I think I know the answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway, is that when you arrived as a young teacher at Linwood, the students, the, re, the relationship you had with the students and the way they viewed you, I bet never changed in the time you, until you left. Because I think you're one of those special teachers where the students will just view in the same way. And I think they do here at the CSM now. Well, it's it's interesting. I sometimes think about it and wonder how it all happened. But, of course, when I first went to Linwood High School, I wasn't much older than the students, than the senior students. Um, and although principals would say, the students are not your friends, <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a classroom, in a school context, they sort of were, not outside of school, um, there was a, you know, there are professional boundaries, obviously, but um, I always had this very Social natural relationship rapport. with, yeah, with students, and that as I got older, it developed rather than diminished, yes. um, and I know, you know, new teachers who would come to my department or into the performing arts area, and they would sometimes comment on this relationship between the, the staff in the department and the students that was clearly different from what they'd experienced before or what was going on in other parts of the school. Yes. Um, and maybe it's because I always had to be my own person. I, when I started teaching in the Hutt Valley, there was no head of department, there was no mentor, I was sort of thrown in at the deep end doing both music and drama and I had to develop my own way of dealing with discipline, dealing with uh, teach, uh, student achievement and but I've always had this expectation of excellence. I you know, I work to the highest common denominator rather than the lowest. Yes. So in an orchestra, for example, in a school orchestra or here at CSM, 
I will think, who are the best players? Make all the others. You know, they're the ones who will who will carry the sound, and they're the ones that you don't want to you don't want them to feel not challenged. Mm. And because they can carry a certain quality of performance and a certain technical proficiency and once again it's that thing of kids trusting you um, they tend to step up yes. yeah and that's always been my way at first it was intuitive but then it became quite deliberate yes and it works so 10 years ago you left Limerick College and how did, and what was the what did you think was ahead of you at that particular point it was that was the time of the earthquakes um, and that was a very, very difficult time for me. Um, this education in Christchurch became very, very difficult in general. Um, I had a house which I lost, um, and the principal, I, I was very lucky with principals at Linwood High School, Linwood College. They always valued the performing arts and they always supported what I was doing. Um, Sometimes, much to the annoyance of <laughs> other teachers or other departments, sometimes, because they thought, they, I mean, there were even comments like, you know, <laughs> music runs the school. Yes. <laughs> <That's terrible. laughs> um, but I believe, you know, students who are involved in drama, music, sport, things like that, st students who are involved in those things, they do better academically, even if they're doing it in class time some of the time. Um, and the evidence anecdotal as it might be, is was there all through my time at, at Linwood College. Um, but we were, at the time of the earthquake, we were planning a big tour with the orchestra festival had developed in Christchurch, the secondary school's orchestra festival, and we had 12, 14, 15 schools who were taking part in that every year. And we really, really enjoyed that um, in taking part in that, seeing the other school orchestras, and it, it it was not competitive, but it was, and I fought at music teacher meetings for it you know, not to have awards, not to have prizes, not to have first, second, and third, not to have gold, silver, bronze, that sort of thing, and in my time it never was, but being there and working with other schools and performing in front of other schools and having them perform in front of you it was quite noticeable how all the schools who took part the standard from year to year just kept increasing and that's what it was all about and most of the most of the other um, heads of music they agreed that it worked well without having any of the sort of formal competi competitive aspect to it. Um, and so then we would have a, an evening concert where each orchestra would play <coughs> one piece. And my orchestra grew because kids got enthusiastic about playing this sort of music because of the orchestra festival. And it happened, I could see it happening at other schools as well, which was just wonderful. Um, and uh, so in this particular year, I think it must have been 2009, I really pushed them and we played three movements from Stravinsky's Firebird Suite. And there were people in the audience who, <laughs> who thought that our performance was quite remarkable. <coughs> and a woman who had previously had a connection with um, Linwood College, who was now on the city council and involved with sister city relationships in other parts of the world, came to us and said, we've got to take you to our sister city in the UK. So we developed this plan to take the orchestra on a trip. And it wasn't working. The ways that my school had undertaken these sorts of things were nothing to do with music in the past and didn't involve such a large number of students. By this time, there were around 80 students in my orchestra. Um, and in the end, we had 70 for a trip that did eventuate. And I contacted uh, the teacher, music teacher at Rangiruru, who I knew had taken music trips, and she told me about um, 
a company who specialised in these music trips who were based in the UK. So I contacted them and they devised this, this trip starting in Italy, Salzburg, France, and then going to the UK, um, and in London, and then our sister city, which of course is Christchurch and Dorset. And money was a problem. The parents became enthusiastic and they were willing to pay 3000 each and fundraising was going averagely. And the earthquake, for a few days, seemed to destroy the whole thing, the whole plan. And all of a sudden, um, Fletcher Construction, who heard about this um, because of a throwaway comment by a parent who was involved, and I got a phone call a couple of days later offering us $50,000. <laughs> and then other people got on board and um, we got all sorts of donations because of the earthquakes from people who had money to spend on Christchurch. But Fletcher's had this fund that they were trying to use for morale, not for infrastructure. And so they gave some of it to us. And then there was um, other groups as well. We got so much money that when we came back from the trip, we had $100,000 spare. <laughs> and, when we, and one of the things that also happened that year was that um, we sent off, the, one of the people organizing it sent off a tape of the orchestra a tape, remember yes. tapes? <laughs> yes, I remember tapes. Uh, to the uh, New Zealand, the people at New Zealand House, yes. um, to because they had the idea of us playing, because we were going to be there at the time of the Anzac Memorial service, the 25th of uh, April um, in Westminster Abbey. And very quickly we got back a message saying, yes, you'd be very welcome. So we played in Westminster Abbey at the, at the 2011... Um, this is Linwood College. Linwood College. This, this, is, this is not a story, this is a movie. Can't, can't. <laughs> <laughs> this is a feel good movie. Yeah. yeah, it's wonderful. It was quite remarkable, yeah. Yes, that, 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 that yeah. is amazing. Mm. Uh, and we yeah. played in Perugia and we played in... Florence, and we played in Venice, and we played in Salzburg, and it was just... They all have a similarity yeah. to Organ Throat, don't they? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and there were kids there were kids from the school, of course, who would not have otherwise travelled, certainly not at that age, and yes. had never owned a passport yes. at my school. Um, mm -hmm. And so that... But they did. And some of them have never travelled since. Um, but all of them, any that I've spoken to have remembered that and will always remember it. Very precious indeed. Mm. Uh, it, that reminds me of a story of Bill Hawkey who was, uh, might have been at the University of Henry Yes, he was. He yes. was one of my, my lecturers, yes. yes. He took the harmonic choir yes. to England on tour uh, and I think it was 300 of them and they sang in Westminster Abbey for Christchurch. And I can only think of the expense of travelling at that time in history. But anyway, yeah. he did it. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, he had a little bit of Tony Ryan in it, like <laughs> determination and, yeah. and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a dream as well. So yeah. when you finally left the school and, and, and you, if I can use the word, retired, did, did you think that you were going to spend the next few years composing? What were you going to do? Were you <laughs> no, well, actually, I was not at an age to retire. I was 60 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and I possibly would have continued, but we'd been thinking of trying to f look for some overseas opportunities, you know, international schools, that sort of thing, but we left it too late. 60 years old, um, people don't hire international teachers yes. when they're <laughs> at that sort of age, generally. Um, but I, the principal of Linwood College had got a job at the Aga Khan Academy, and a, an almost brand new school in Mombasa in Kenya. So um, the Aga Khan Academy was run by um, the Ismailis, which are a, a, a branch of Shia Muslims. Mm -hmm. And he got this job, but he, when he went there, he found that the performing arts were sadly underrepresented 
and he wanted that to happen. So he had been pestering me already for a couple of years to go there. And because of the earthquake, I, I resisted because of the trip. We went ahead with the trip, came back, and then I finally agreed. I say, okay, yes, I'll, I'll come and give this a go. Um, so I resigned from Linwood College uh, at the end of 2011. Um, and in 2012, I started um, as head of the performing arts at the Aga Khan Academy in Mombasa in Kenya, <laughs> which was a huge adventure. And um, I'm so glad that I had the opportunity to do it. <laughs> I had no idea, Tony. That's, that's, that's incredible. And, and, and were there any similarities at all between no, Linwood and no. College? The principal picked me up from the airport, picked my wife Ursula and I up from the airport. And as we drove out of the driveway of the airport in Mombasa, um, he said, right, prepare yourselves for a culture shock and, you know, the street, everything about what what we saw as we drove the half hour or so from the airport to the school campus was confronting, astonishing. Yeah. It wasn't really confronting because I'd been made to trust that it was safe. Yes. After living there for well, for some months, you realise that it wasn't as safe as it seemed. <laughs> I was lucky enough to live on campus, um, but quite a few of the teachers at the school lived off campus. Um, but po po possibly the biggest industry in Mombasa is security. So the school had 15 guards around the huge perimeter of the school, which was... Um, and, you know, even houses have high high walls and gates and that sort of thing. And you're very comfortable walking out on the streets in the daytime, but you wouldn't do it at night. It's fine taking a, you know, a tuk-tuk or a, or a, what do they call them? The, uh, uh, these 14-seater vans that carted people around the yes. city. Yeah, and that, that was always fine. If you were going, you know, to a restaurant or uh, to some event or something like that, that was always fine. But it was a... It was a very different world from what I've been used to. I've done a bit of travelling, but in Europe, you know, yes. um, in, in places where the type of Western civilization of music and everything that I've been involved with happens. Yes. Um, so this was this was a real first. It tell was, me the spirit of the of the students. Was well, it, was it that was it same sort of as in Linwood? No. Because this was a highly academic school who uh, had paying students from countries all over Africa and the Middle East, basically. And one of the Aga Khan's aims was to uh, offer as many scholarships as possible to talented students who basically lived in poverty in Mombasa. And the, the plan was to build 15 of these around the third world. By the time I left there, I think there were four, in, two in Africa, one in India, and one somewhere else. But um, the students were highly motivated. There was no, basically no place there for them if they weren't highly motivated. <laughs> um, so it wasn't like the village school down the road in Mombasa. It was uh, a very specialised environment. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Quite so intense, very, very, very intense um, indeed. But because the principal wanted the performing arts, the, 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 the performing arts then started to happen. Um, unfortunately, he had problems with convincing them about his vision and the way that the place was financed. Um, and so, the way, unlike New Zealand, the principal basically controls the finances as well, or people take his advice on finances, but here, not. And he got very frustrated with that. and he left after I'd been there for two years whereupon he went to Singapore 
and he started to pester me to go there as well, <laughs> which I did. <laughs> yeah. So I taught at an international school for three years in Singapore before reaching, and then, you know, after reaching 65, <laughs> we decided, okay, let's retire. We can't do this forever. And so we came back at the end of that time. Singapore, the opposite to Mombasa. The climate's the same, you know, hot and humid, night and day, all year round. Um, but the culture is so is the complete opposite from a third world country to an excessively um, safe and uh, glitzy yes. uh, type of lifestyle <laughs> well, well, to have those changes at a time and I thought you were going to say you retired and concentrated on your futures uh, <laughs> so, so you, you came back to Christchurch and now you've been uh, embraced by the music community who, who want as much of Tony Ryan as they possibly can. Well, that seems to have happened. I I was re actually reluctant to retire, but my wife had his family here and she wanted to come back and uh, she didn't have possibly quite... She, she, she had she, good jobs while, she was, while we were overseas, but n not rewarding in the same way that I have always found teaching rewarding. Yes. Um, and so... Although I was a little reluctant at first, when I came back, we spent a few months, um, you know, getting our, you know, setting up house and getting organised and that sort of thing. And then people started to ask if I was interested in this or that in terms of, you know, it was mostly orchestras and conducting and that sort of thing. And some of my former students were members of founding members of Resonance Ensemble, which I had never heard of. It was yes. founded while I was away. Mm. Um, and uh, I went along to hear them, and I found that it was a pretty good orchestra. And so they asked if I was interested uh, in you know, conducting one of their concerts. So I conducted one of their concerts, and... They've asked me back ever since, <laughs> yes. uh, which is which is really really nice. Yes. And then of course, around about the same time, um, Celia, the uh, head of um, the music director of CSM, um, she knew. I mean, I had said to her, I'd I'd come to a CSM concert uh, where I had a, a young niece involved, a young great niece involved, um, and she and I said, you know, if there's anything going at CSM, I am interested. She contacted me and said, you know, we might um, we might have to do something about uh, helping Neville out with symphonia. Um, but then she said it would have to be done in an audition. Part. But eventually she just asked me outright and said, yes. would you be interested? And so I was very happy to come along and share that position of conducting the Senior Saturday Orchestra Symphonia with Neville, um, mm. which I did. Uh, for three years um, and uh, I'm doing it by myself now of course yes. yeah that's great yeah and, and, uh, and you've just had your tuba concerto performed to great success do you have plans to write more pieces uh, I've been doing more I, I did write a lot of music for students and my wife was a singer um and so I wrote a lot of music for her, which was then also performed by other pe other people. But a lot of song cycles, um, things like that, even a, even an opera, which uh, we did back in the nineties, um, at nineteen nineties, we did. Um, it was based on a story which I've always loved, the Musicians of Bremen, and we did eight performances of that in the Great Hall, which was very very successful and uh, Elra Cooper who was director of court theatre came along he's a great opera man and I'd also worked with him with Can on Can in Canterbury Opera um, in its day uh, and he came along and suddenly asked me would I be interested in writing music for their summer show so I wrote music for Alice Margaret Mayhe along with Lewis Carroll wrote the words <laughs> <laughs> uh, of the story so it was Alice in Wonderland and I wrote music for that which was a great opportunity and I've all and I so I've I wrote music for 
other court theatre, Shakespeare productions as well, incidental music. And I did, l of course, lots and lots of school shows for Linwood, some of them singing shows, some of them incidental music. We turned Shakespeare into musical wonders, not singing wonders, but plays with lots of drama, lots of music, in the way that you might have um, music in a movie. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, yes. So there was, there was all that sort of thing. But it, it, but it was sporadic, yes. because teaching is a time-consuming, teaching, full-time school teaching is very time consuming and I don't know how I managed to fit in some of the things that I did but the composition sort of got pushed aside but since I've been back there's been a lot more of it and when Thomas Ellerly from the Queensland Symphony asked if he could come and do this tuba concerto he was a former student of mine at Linwood and I actually wrote it for him when he was a student um, and I revised it slightly when he got asked to play it as a soloist with the National, with the New Zealand Secondary School Symphony Orchestra in Auckland. But it hasn't been done since. He's done it with piano at various tuba conferences around the world. He's mentioned uh, Chicago and Salzburg. Um, <laughs> but he, when he asked if he could come and do it with resonance, I realised it had to be written for a professional orchestra and it had to, it had to be tightened up and had to work as a piece of music in its own right, not just a, in, a, in a student sort of way. So I did that. I did a very, very thorough makeover of it and um, we scheduled it for 2020. COVID travel restrictions stopped, cancelled it. We scheduled it for last year as well, the, uh, 2021. Same thing happened. Two days before he was due to fly, the travel restrictions were reintroduced. And so I said to him, how about, we had a date, we had the piano booked, the piano venue booked for the 4th of December, and I said, how, how does that date work for you? Came back to me a couple of year, days later, and he said, that, that, that might work, that might work. And so that, it happened, mm -hmm. and it was great. It was great to have a former student. He's not the only one who's, who's been, the only former student who's been involved in some of those concerts. Um, uh, but it's great to to have had them inspire me to do something like that back then, and yes. then being able to revisit it, revisit it in yes. in a, a more professional context. Yeah. Well, I am just very grateful to Ursula suggesting that you become a teacher. <laughs> I think that you have just added so much to music in New Zealand and, uh, and, and further afield as well. So, Tony, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Matt.